Hello, and welcome to this channel. In this video, we are going to discuss a very important topic of internal and chest medicine, which is the interstitial lung diseases, or in short, ILDs. So let's dive in. Interstitial lung disease is a generic term that is used to describe a heterogeneous group of conditions, all of which primarily affects the lung parenchyma in a diffuse manner. These conditions are characterized by chronic inflammation, with or without progressive interstitial fibrosis. ILD is now more appropriately known as diffuse parenchymal lung disease, or DPLD. This term is coined to make a point that the interstitium is not the only compartment that is affected, but sometimes these diseases can involve the alveolar spaces as well. The conditions that are collected within DPLD all share several clinical and pathological features. And in the next few slides, we will see what are those common clinical and pathological features. First, let's look at the clinical features. The common features include the clinical presentation of these diseases, the features on examination, radiology, and the features on the pulmonary function tests. Starting with the clinical presentation, all of these diseases present with a cough that is typically dry and distressing. The next common and frequent feature is breathlessness. Its onset is often insidious, but thereafter it is relentlessly progressive. Sometimes, you may be able to note the signs related to systemic diseases, like thickened skin and scleroderma, a heliotrope rash and Gautrin's papules and dermatomyositis, hand deformities and rheumatoid arthritis, etc. Physical examination may reveal clubbing, which is common in idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, but this may also be seen in other diseases, like asbestosis. Central cyanosis and signs of right heart failure may be noted in advanced disease. On lung auscultation, crackles are audible. These crackles are very typical and are also usually called Velcro type of crackles. These are heard bilaterally on lung bases. Signs of core pulmonal may be present, which include the presence of left parasternal heave, a loud pulmonary component of S2, an increase in the physiological splitting of S2, raised JVP, and peripheral edema. Coming on to the radiological features of DPLD. In the earliest stages, the typical radiographic findings include ground glass and reticulonodular shadowing, and then with progression of disease, to honeycomb cysts and traction bronchiectasis. While these appearances may be seen on a plain chest x-ray as well, they are most easily appreciated on HRCT, which has assumed a central role in the evaluation of DPLDs. On chest x-ray, you will appreciate that there are typically small lung volumes, with reticulonodular shadowing. However, the chest x-ray may be normal in an early or limited disease. High-resolution CT scans will reveal combinations of ground glass changes, reticulonodular shadowing, honeycomb cysts, and traction bronchiectasis, all depending on the stage of the disease. Now proceeding to pulmonary function tests. All these groups of diseases share the common finding on spirometry, which is a restrictive ventilatory defect, where both forced vital capacity and forced expiratory volume in one second are reduced, and the ratio of FEV1 to FVC is either normal or increased. Furthermore, in lung functions tests, there is the presence of small lung volumes and reduced gas transfer. This is the summary of common clinical features in diffuse parenchymal lung diseases. Common pathological features in DPLD include the presence of chronic inflammation, hyperplasia of type 2 pneumocytes, and in advanced disease, the presence of fibrosis and remodeling of the interstitium. Now we will discuss the next important part of DPLDs, which is their classification. The ILDs can be broadly grouped into three categories, depending on the cause. In the first category, 
there is a known cause for the development of DPLD. The second category includes DPLDs due to a systemic disorder. And the third category is where no known cause is found for DPLD, that is, idiopathic. This category makes up the largest proportion of DPLDs. The diseases in this group are also called idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. Coming on to the category 1. The category with known causes include Occupational or environmental causes, certain drugs, hypersensitivity reactions, and gastroesophageal reflux disease. Occupational or environmental factors include diseases such as asbestosis, beryliosis, silicosis, and bisinosis, which is also called cotton workers' lung. Drugs that can cause interstitial lung disease include nitrofurantoin, amiodarone, bleomycin, sulfasalazine, and busulfan. Next, in hypersensitivity reactions, include hypersensitivity pneumonitis, previously known as extrinsic allergic alveolitis. In this, there is a hypersensitivity reaction to certain organic products. Systemic disorders that can also cause interstitial lung disease include sarcoidosis, rheumatoid arthritis, SLE, systemic sclerosis, mixed connective tissue disease, and Sjogren's syndrome. At times, interstitial lung diseases can also be caused by ulcerative colitis, renal tubular acidosis, and autoimmune thyroid disease. Moving on to the next category. As mentioned already, the idiopathic group of DPLD makes up a very large proportion of interstitial lung disease patients. Diseases in this category have unknown etiology and are also known as idiopathic interstitial pneumonia. The diseases in this group are distinguished based on predominant histological patterns, and therefore these are frequently named after their pathological description. The most common disease in this idiopathic category is idiopathic pulmonary fibrosis, which is also known as cryptogenic fibrosing alveolitis. Its histopathological name is usual interstitial pneumonia. Other diseases in the idiopathic group include cryptogenic organizing pneumonia, which was previously known as bronchiolitis obliterans organizing pneumonia. Then, others are nonspecific interstitial pneumonitis, acute interstitial pneumonia, desquamative interstitial pneumonia, and lymphocytic interstitial pneumonia. After looking at the common features and classification, let's see which investigations we do in DPLDs and their purpose. So, after taking an appropriate history and doing relevant physical examination, we will do lab and radiological investigations, pulmonary function tests, bronchoscopy, and in some cases, video-assisted thoracoscopic lung biopsy. Laboratory investigations that can help us in the evaluation of DPLDs include complete blood counts. In this, the differential leukocytes may point towards some of the diseases, like lymphopenia is found in sarcoidosis, eosinophilia in pulmonary eosinophilias and drug reactions, and neutrophilia in hypersensitivity pneumonitis. You may find hypercalcemia in sarcoidosis. Lactate dehydrogenase may be found elevated in active alveolitis. Serum angiotensin converting enzyme is a nonspecific indicator of disease activity in sarcoidosis. ESR and C-reactive protein are nonspecifically raised. And you may also need to do autoimmune screening, depending on the history and examination. For example, anti-CCP antibodies for rheumatoid arthritis and other autoantibodies relevant to another connective tissue disease. Under radiological investigations, as already mentioned under common features, an X-ray, an HRCT chest may reveal ground glass appearance, reticulonodular shadowing, honeycombing of the lung parenchyma, and fibrosis and traction bronchiectasis depending on the stage and extent of the disease. HRCT chest is the preferred modality of investigations because it can confirm or exclude the presence of interstitial lung disease, 
quantify the disease extent, and in some cases, even help in diagnosing the cause. Similarly, as also mentioned under common features, pulmonary function tests will show restrictive lung defect and small lung volumes with reduced gas transfer. Exercise tests may also be performed, which assess exercise tolerance and exercise-related falls in oxygen saturation. Bronchoscopy with bronchoalveolar lavage may give you differential cell counts and may point to sarcoidosis drug-induced pneumonitis, pulmonary eosinophilia, hypersensitivity pneumonitis, or cryptogenic organizing pneumonia. It is also of value in excluding infection. Transbronchial biopsy is useful in diagnosing sarcoidosis and in excluding differentials of DPLD, like malignancy or infection. Bronchial biopsy is occasionally useful in sarcoidosis. Video-assisted thoracoscopic lung biopsy, or VATS, is done in selected cases. It helps in the pathological classification of the disease. Furthermore, the presence of asbestos bodies may suggest asbestosis and silica in occupational fibrosing lung disease. Differential diagnosis Some other conditions may mimic DPLDs, and these need to be differentiated. These include certain infections, like viral pneumonia, pneumocystis gerevichiae infection, mycoplasma pneumonia, tuberculosis, parasites like filariasis, and certain fungal infections. Malignancies, like leukemia and lymphoma, lymphangitic carcinomatosis, multiple metastases, and bronchoalveolar carcinoma. At times, even pulmonary edema and aspiration pneumonitis need to be differentiated from DPLDs. And with this, we have come to the end of this video. Please press the like button if you like the content, share it with your other colleagues as well, and consider subscribing to this channel to receive notifications about the latest uploads. See you in the next video.